Almighty God, through your Holy Spirit, may we have insight into this scripture. May we have insight into the people here presented and into the meaning, the rich meaning, woven through the words which we say. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, I'm not going to preach strictly about what it would seem obvious to preach about, because we've already had, the week before last, a sermon about Mary and the Annunciation and the role of Mary and the archetype, the type that she represents, the perfect Christian response to God, that be it unto me according to thy word, that response which risked everything and yet through which came God robed in human flesh. Goodness, I've pretty much preached it again. At <laughs> this time it only took two minutes and not 25 minutes. Um, <laughs> so instead, if we look at the picture we have there, it's actually Elizabeth. And the child, even at that early stage, is depicted as being a little out there. That's John the Baptist with the wild hair. And later, if you look at early icons, he has these fabulous dreads all over the place. You know. He is clearly something rich and strange. So, the archetype that we're looking for here, and you know, by that I really mean uh, uh, the rich symbol captured in a living person is Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is often overlooked. Uh, why? Well, yeah, she's a woman, but so was Mary. Uh, there's a lot of overlooking of women goes on in, in more recent Christianity. Uh, I'd say in the very early church that wasn't the case, and I'll hopefully make a case for that until the good old-fashioned patriarchy kicked in uh, when Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire. Um, so, she was also overlooked because she was elderly and barren. But of course, that's the whole point. She wasn't barren. She gave birth to the one who prepared the straight way for Jesus. She was absolutely vital. And her response was very much like the response of Mary. It was a, be it unto me according to thy word. It reminds me of Sarah's response when she was told in her old age that she was going to have a child. She said, what, am I to have pleasure? <laughs> that wasn't a double entendre, that was a single entendre. <laughs> she effectively said, am I to get lucky? Am I to get lucky? She was laughing. She was, you know, really? Come on. I'm in my 70s here, you know. But she was told she was going to have a child. Well, we're not told that Elizabeth came out with any sarky comments uh, when she was told she was going to give birth to a child. But, my goodness, there is something here. There is something powerful for all of us. Elizabeth gets lucky. Being barren in the first century, and barren is a purely awful word for uh, infertile, but being barren in the first century generally meant that a man was expected and certainly permitted to put you aside, uh, either in favor of a second or a third or a fourth wife, or replacing you completely. Uh, this would not have been considered a moral issue, it would have been considered good sense. Sometimes if a woman was lucky, she could present a servant to her husband, and the child would be had by proxy, uh, like a surrogate child. You know, and of course that happened with Sarah initially, and then they got pregnant and had their own child, and they put to one side the first child, which is often the case. But either way, it was a sorry reflection upon not just the Jewish world, uh, but the Greco-Roman world's opinion of women uh, that if a woman was barren, she was pretty much worthless as far as they were concerned. It is because of the status of divorced women, and that's a similar business, we're talking about somebody being barren, being able to be divorced just with a writ of divorcement. That is the man writing down, I divorce you, and giving it to the woman with no reasons needed whatsoever. And then there's a divorce affected. She has no further rights. She has no rights over property, no such thing as alimony. She has no rights of a roof over her head. The society is not equipped 
to give her a place of safety and comfort or even a place where there is food. If she has children, she has no rights to see those children anymore. Those children are not her children. Those children are her husbands or her ex-husbands. Because that man is the paterfamilias. That man has control over life and death of everybody in the household. That was the Roman way, and it was a way that the Jewish society of the Near East adopted um, vigorously. Vigorously. It was a barbaric, but it was utterly normal. And because of its normality, it puts into its proper context the Christian Gospels, and even the writings of St. Paul, and the attitude towards the uh, spirit and testimony and words and prayer and existence of women, which they lift up over and above uh, Everything in their society that came before. <laughs> everything that surrounded them. And in fact, everything that continued for hundreds of years afterwards. It was utterly abnormal what was being preached. Now, don't take my word for it. Uh, let's have a look at uh, what contemporary Judaism, or let's say contemporary uh, Jewish writers, held up as regards the role of women. Well, we've got two main characters there. There's Josephus and there's Fire. Both of them were um, widely respected writers. They were both Jewish uh, and they were respected within the Greco-Roman world. So here's what they said. Here's what they actually published. Uh, the overall sense from Josephus was that women were valued in the same way that oxen, slaves, or other possessions were valued. Uh, with no detectable reverence paid to their humanity. According to Josephus, uh, women were valuable only insofar as they were to be utilized for purposes of procreation and the sexual satisfaction of men. However, men were considered wise to guard themselves from the wiles of women who used their sexuality to corrupt the male psyche. According to Josephus, uh, the Pharisees believed that men were to guard against the lascivious behavior of women and are persuaded that none of them preserved their fidelity uh, to one man. During his account of the Vespasians, the Emperor Vespasian's siege of Jotapata, uh, Josephus believed in confining women to their homes lest they should render the warlike actions of the men too effeminate. Now this is a strange concept. Uh, the ancient Greeks, and actually some of the Roman writers, believed that if you fell in love with a woman, it made you effeminate. And that uh, intimacy with women made you effeminate. It feminized you. Which is why many of the Greek authors counsel against it most vigorously. Uh, and believe that the only falling in love that was going to be done should involve another guy. Uh, if you were a guy. That's bizarre by modern standards, isn't it? Us thinking that, ah, oh, well, you know, if you're going to fall in love with a woman, then you must be a permanent. My goodness! <laughs> All of this reflected a sense of cowering feminine dependency and implied on inferiority judged not by the relative members of individual members of the gender group, but as a result of a natural incapacity seated in that gender collective. So that's Josephus. Charming guy. <laughs> Philo regarded women as irrational creatures who are ruled primarily by emotions. For are not those persons womanly in whose minds reason is overcome by compassion? Along the same lines, he stated that the masculine soul is that which devotes itself to God alone as the father and creator of the universe and the cause of all things that exist. But the female soul is that which depends upon all the things which are created. So there you go. There are the two greatest and most visible Jewish writers of the time writing about the role of women. Now it's necessary for me to read this to you and to give you that position because from our perspective it's easy to look back upon the Christian Gospels and think, oh my goodness, I wish they were a little more... But by contrast, what was being taught was utterly radical. Utterly radical, even by support. 
By the way, Josephus uh, went on to uh, divorce three women. Uh, the one because she gave birth to three children, two of which died. And because two had died, he felt that she was not up to scratch, and therefore she was put aside. And the one that survived, she never saw again. Um, it's not recorded that Josephus even had any contacts with her in the, after that point. Um, the second one just displeased him in some way. I forget how. I think he just said displeased him. Uh, and the third one, well, frankly, I forgot the reason. But that painful truth about our, uh, these people are our philosophical forefathers. And I say fathers, they're our philosophical forefathers. This is the foundation of Western civilization. This is uh, the Greco-Roman principles, including the Jewish Hebrew principles, bound together that formed the foundation of everything which came to be the West. Shorn of the traditions in Asia and in Africa and in South America and North America prior to the arrival of the Europeans. This is the bedrock that we see. And on that bedrock was built the Word of God in the Gospels. And the Word of God was like a pickaxe driving into that bedrock and splitting it asunder and saying, this is not of God. So we see the extraordinary truth that the witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ are not men of high standing. They're a collection of women whose voices carried no testimony in law, whose testimony would be counted worthless in a court of law. But they are given the supreme task of proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is only made possible because of the freely given yes of Mary, a young woman, a teenage woman in all probability. And then there's John the Baptist, the essential John the Baptist, the one we look to, the voice crying in the wilderness, the one making a straight path for God, that extraordinary John the Baptist, that queer John the Baptist, queer and weird in so many ways. And his mother, this elderly woman, who had been discounted as barren. She had been discounted as barren all the years of her life. Her husband was presumably, by his standards of the day, an extremely tolerant man who loved her. Because she was still there, she still had Zechariah, a holy man. But she had been discounted as barren, and that means that in her time, all her dreams and her hopes and her expectations and her humanity would have been put aside. All the things that she would have been brought up hoping for had never happened. Now there's a story there. It sounds a bit obvious when it comes down to a preacher saying it, but there's a reason that these archetypes are in Scripture. There's a reason they're in the Gospel. It's because they have a message for us. They're not there as historical accident. They're there because they are pregnant with meaning. They are rich. There's a wonderful word. Fecund. Fertile. With meaning. How many of us have been told we are barren? How many of us have been told that there is nothing to come forth from us? That we can never give birth to a live, living thing? We have been told, just like the prophet Isaiah, when the prophet Isaiah says about eunuchs, he said, And you eunuchs have been told that you have been cut off. I will give you a name above all names. Well, here Elizabeth is being raised up above all women virtually, and she is barren. She carries a title that her society has given her, which says she is without worth. And yet God speaks differently. The Word of God speaks to her and says, You who have been called barren will give birth to an extraordinary child. And that extraordinary child will make a path for the Son of God, the child of God. God robed in human flesh. Think about that. An old barren lady, disregarded by virtually everybody, 
with no social status or standing at all in the society in which she lived, who could be put aside just with a piece of paper. And she was the two most, one of the two most important human beings on earth at that time. Mary who said yes, and Elizabeth who said yes. Mary, the teenager, the child almost, and Elizabeth, the old woman. Mary, who said, I have no husband. What's to become of me? And think carefully. The messenger, angel, is another one of those difficult words that for some reason uh, uh, <clears throat> the biblical translators choose certain words not to translate. Uh, so that they come into our vocabulary as if they are special set-aside words that mean something other than what they do mean. You know, uh, Angelos is just, it means messenger in exactly the same way that we would understand it to mean messenger, you know? The messenger came down and gave the news to Mary, and then the messenger said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will give birth. The Holy Spirit also came upon um, the disciples of Pentecost. That doesn't actually necessarily infer any sort of intimacy, as it were. So, I have read you uh, that section on Philo and that section on Josephus. Mm -hmm. I've talked to you about Elizabeth, uh, but uh, that's not good enough uh, because we need to be able to recognize ourselves in Elizabeth. Uh, we need to be able to bring forth something which we are being called to bring forth. It's not good enough uh, to be reassured by the existence of Elizabeth and say, oh, well, that's nice. There was this old lady 2,000 years ago, and she, uh, uh, she was told that she couldn't have children. She had a child. Lovely. It's not historical accident. It is intrinsic to the nature of God's relationship with humanity. It's not a factoid from 2,000 years ago. It goes to the heart of God's relationship with humankind, as does the Annunciation to Mary. It goes to the heart of what it is to be a human being, as does the advent of Jesus Christ, only God, fully God and fully man. These things are not historical accidents, and therefore, the historicity of them, the fact bit of them, is completely beside the bar. They go to the heart of the relationship that God chooses to have with humanity. The relationship which God has with every last one of you, whether you know it or not, and whether you like it or not. It is the same God who is calling out to you and saying, well, you've been called barren. Who are you going to believe? The people who called you barren or me? Fundamentally, we've touched upon this before now. Who are we to believe? Are we to believe the same God who wrote the truth upon our flesh? Or are we to believe disinterested parties who may shout something at us and, and then never give us another thought? And yet we take those words and we clutch them to our bosom like a viper. A dangerous thing to clutch close to our heart. So I have a task for you before now and Christmas Eve. You don't have long for it because it's only a few days until I see you on Christmas Eve. <laughs> and then it's only a few hours until I see you on Christmas Day. Isn't it, brethren and sestrum? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I doubt I'll think so too. <laughs> hey, I said, you know, I miss Louisiana sometimes. <laughs> you got loud congregations telling you, preach it, Pastor. <laughs> It's reassuring. It's comforting. Thank you very much, girl. <laughs> Louder next time, please. <laughs> we only have a few dates. Uh, and it's best to concentrate on one thing at a time. So let's think of this. Let's think of all the areas where you've been told you are barren. Think of all the dreams and hopes and aspirations which you have put to bed, which you have put to one side because you knew they were never for you. Think of the vocations you have from God. The ways in which you've been told you can serve God with your gifts and you've assumed there's always someone better who can do it. 
You've always assumed that, ah, well, such and such is doing it, so I have no place doing that. Of course, the point is that such and such is such and such doing it. You are you doing it. We need Clinton's preaching, yes we do, but we also need Jim's preachings and Noah's preachings. We need Doug's gifts, we need Ken's gifts, we need your gifts. We need uniquely your gifts from God. And if you've been told that you are barren, and if you assume that you've reached a certain age that you cannot have these gifts anymore, well I am here to tell you that you are utterly and absolutely wrong, you are mistaken. You are mistaken. You are never told. Age brings a maturity and a richness, well sometimes, a maturity and a richness which cannot be given by any other means. Wisdom is the most precious thing that humans can gather on this earth. You may reach 70 or you may reach 80 and God may have a vocation for you. John's vocation, sorry John, I'm using you as an example is a vocation to be a spirit of welcome. That whenever anybody comes into this church, there is something who has, somebody who has put themselves out to be there to welcome them, to greet them, yes. to give them what they need that they may worship God. Yes. And who knows what else you have in your vocation. We'll keep liturgical dance to one side. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. But you know, please, over the next couple of days, think about this very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, because you can use up a whole life without uh, bringing this into effect. You know, you can live a whole life with it always being uh, someone else will do it. Or, yeah. no, this isn't for me. Or, I'd be embarrassed. Or, I'm not good enough. <laughs> you know, it is your uniqueness that makes you good enough. And the fact that you're being called to do it from God. Although I am quite sure, uh, and I'm telling you this because the baby Jesus told me so, uh, that none of you have been called to pastor the church just yet. 